Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay, another part for the catechism, the Protestant catechism. <laughs> Catechisms for the Protestants, in other words. Today we're going to talk about Whit Sunday. Um, this, I found this book, just to reiterate again, I found this book at the used bookstore, which I can't go into anymore because they're very adamant about masks and everything. Um, how they're still in business, I don't know how anybody's still in business when they're doing it because I understand a lot of people doing it but anyway don't want to go off on something else I can't go back there that was one of my loves one of my joys that the Lord gave me was going through this bookstore in Gold Beach I'd take the back road to Gold Beach I'd eat at a um, old-fashioned pizza place with its um, wood stove pizzas and everything and now I can't go there anymore because they start uh, so many on modest addressed women there was satanic style music last time I tried to go I made a trip at the beginning of this month to see if I could go back to doing those trips again and it was just hard uh, standing there in modestly dressed women were everywhere uh, they had satanic style music playing it's like they totally came to be more modern and it's like I got it to go. I went and sat and watched the boats that they were fishing out by the river, Rogue River, and I told myself, I just, I guess I just can't go there anymore. I don't want to compromise. And I used to like sitting down. There's a spot where you could sit down. You could see the ocean while you're eating pizza, old wood stove pizzas. But there's just times where you're gonna have to give up a lot in this life to serve the Lord and please God. But the whole point is, is I would do that. I'd walk on the beach with Victoria, my miniature schnauzer, and I would go to the bookstore. And I'd look at all these books, and God showed me a lot of these old books. And one of the books I came across was this catechism. All right? And I'm like, there's a catechism for pro uh, for Protestants? I thought catechism, I know the word catechism doesn't mean Catholic. If you look up the word catechism, it's just a question and answer book, basically. Um, but Protestants have one. So I started going through here, and we started doing videos showing how this is actually just Catholic. Protestants is the, the, the Protestant Reformation was just people saying we want to reform the Catholic Church. We don't want to have we don't want to be separate from it and obey the Word of God. We don't want to be completely separated from it. We just want to reform it. We still want to be Catholic, but just our own form of Catholic. So the average professing Christian today is, is can be traced back to the Catholic Church, Reformed Catholicism. Okay. It's not based off of Bible believing, God fearing men and women. I want nothing to do with the Catholic Church. And uh, so that's where we get this. So one of the chapters that I wanted to do, and I was really getting really jump on it, is called Trinity Day. And once again, like I said, you have a lot of these professing Christians. I'm not Catholic. I'm not Catholic. Do you believe in the Trinity? Well, yeah, I believe in the Trinity. It's, 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 it's a fundamental doubt, doctrine. You're Catholic. And then you talk to people, and some people don't really believe the Trinity. They believe the Godhead, but they're using Trinity terms. Okay? The people who vehemently believe in the Trinity, its terms, everything about the Trinity, you have to go away from Scripture to preach the Trinity and prove the Trinity. You have to add to Scripture and subtract from Scripture. You can't just deal with the Scriptures as they are. Okay, capital T Trinity for God, a title for God that's not in Scripture. All right? But where did that come from? It came from the Catholic Church. Okay, a lot of things like... Uh, Rapture, I believe rapture. I haven't done a study on this yet, but I believe that the word rapture comes from the Catholic Church. You won't find it in Scripture. There is no rapture in Scripture. There's a catching away of the body of Christ, but there's no rapture in Scripture. Why do people keep using the word rapture? Well, it's because they're bringing it from the, they got it from the Catholic Church. Okay, all these falsehoods. Okay, you can lose your salvation. But anyway. Back to what we're talking about. I wanted to do the Trinity Day study, so I got into the, doing the Trinity Day study, and it started mentioning t the Trinity is seven days. It's the following Sunday after Whit Sunday. Whit Sunday. Whit Sunday. And I'm like, I have no clue what Whit Sunday is. Never heard of it before in my life. And so that's what we're going to do. I had to go back a chapter and do another section on the book so we can get through that, so then we can get into Trinity Day to find out, well, where does this Trinity thing really come from? Of course, remember, we're just basing it off this, in the sense of, this is supposed to be Protestant, but it's Catholic. What does it really tie back to? So far, we've proven Catholic, Catholic, Catholic. It's nothing but Catholic. But I'm doing this for instruction in righteousness. I'm doing it so we can learn to... Oops. Uh, rendering a video. And it got done pretty quick. Um, 
But uh, I wanted you guys to realize that this is our final authority. If someone's handing out these, someone's handing out... I'll grab this. I got a new section of these books in. I also emailed to that brother in Christ. I did, not email, I mailed out some gospel tracts to you. So uh, they're on their way. I always like to throw one of these books in. But, uh, brother JT, uh, he, he did this book on how to be saved and know it. And when you're handing these books out and someone hands you a book like this, this is truth. Don't get me wrong. So Brother JT, I'm not attacking Brother JT. But when someone hands you a book like this, and they're trying to quote scripture, and they're trying to say this is the way things are. You need to have this right beside it. Someone who gets saved, this can lead someone to Christ, the true plan of salvation. They're going to get a King James Bible, and it's going to expound on everything that's been said in here. When you're a Christian, you get a book, and they're saying, hey, here's a good book. You're supposed to compare it with scripture. Okay. So when someone comes along and tries to deceive you with this, what do you do? You compare it with Scripture. And oftentimes, a lot of our studies we've done on this, you can't compare it with Scripture because it's not in Scripture. You type in Whit Sunday, Sun, which is Whit Sunday. Uh, uh, some people try to say white, but there's no E. Whit Sunday. Um, it's not in Scripture. You type in uh, Sword Searcher, Whit Sunday. You won't find it. It's not in Scripture. So first thing you got to ask yourself is, when you start hearing terms and stuff that's not found in Scripture, where did they get it? They didn't get it from the Word of God. Where did they get it? You hear the word Trinity. It's not in Scripture. Where did they get it? You, a person who has a love of the truth says, okay, God, it's not in your Word. Where did they get it? Rapture. Not in your Word. So where did they get it? And you start researching and having a love of the truth, and you find out it comes from way over here. It doesn't come from here. Okay. Whit Sunday. Chapter and verse on Whit Sunday. I put that on the question mark. It's always what you always have to ask. When someone asks you something that you're like, I'm not sure that's in the Bible. I've been wrong before, brothers and sisters of Christ. Someone said something once and I'm like, I'm not so sure that's in the Bible. And it's the way I was spelling it. Either I was misspelling it or, uh, what was it? Um, conviction. I typed that in and couldn't find it in the Bible. And But convicted is in the Bible. It's also how you type stuff in. Um, so I'm here and I go conviction no verses found. And I'm like, well, it's not, conviction's not in the Bible. Well, you type in the word convict for like convicted and convicted is in the Bible. John 8, 9. You see what I'm saying? You always ask, is it in Scripture? There's times where I've been wrong, and it is in Scripture, okay? And there's times where it's not in Scripture. There's nothing wrong with asking somebody you trust, hey, chapter and verse. If someone told me, you know, they say, well, I trust you, and I trust the ministry God has blessed you with, but you said something, chapter and verse. That won't offend me at all. Let's go through the chapter. Maybe I, missed, I slipped up and said something wrong. Maybe I said it, but didn't reference it, okay? You always go chapter and verse. So someone says, what Sunday is in the Bible? Chapter and verse. Where's writ Sunday? The word writ Sunday. Not in there. So we're going to go with the first member. This is a question and answer. We're just going to go through. What I've been doing is just going through here. And every question it asks and it gives its own answer, we try to find the answer based off Scripture. And if it's something that's not found in Scripture, we try to show the truth behind it that they're not telling you. By research. Okay. So that's what we're doing. So the first question in the book is, when does the festival of Whit Sunday occur? It says, ten days after the ascension of Christ. Okay. Ten days after the ascension of Christ. Now, we're going to get into this. I'm going to be like, where did they get this ten-day part? I couldn't find it in Scripture. And I'm saying, brother, says Christ, the whole point is, is Whit Sunday is not in Scripture. You should have nothing to do with it. But here's the thing. If I missed it, and there's somewhere in Scripture where it shows that ten, exactly ten days after the ascension of Jesus Christ was the day of Pentecost, Whit Sunday, or I'm getting ahead of myself, they're claiming that Whit Sunday is the day of Pentecost. So why not call it the day of Pentecost? Why do you have to use a pagan origin that dates back, as we go through the study, dates back to a pagan religion? Pagan practices. 
That's what the Catholic Church is all about, brothers and sisters of Christ. They are pagan to the core. They have so much paganism and pagan practices, and then comes Constantine, oh, I'm going to become a Christian, and he takes all his pagan practices of Rome and disguises them as Christian practices. But the origins of all of them is pagan. You do the research back far enough, it's pagan. You can't find it in Scripture. So it says, 10 days after the ascension of Christ. Let's go to the second question that's in the book. What festival of the Jews corresponds with this day? Answer, the day of Pentecost, or the 50th day after Passover. So when a kid's reading that book, they may, they, that book makes it out like this is just equal to Scripture. But they don't show any Scripture at all in those two questions and answers. No Scripture. Let's look at the Scriptures. How are they getting these dates? I can only find one date, one set of days in there that will give us 40 days. 4-0. But where are they getting the 10 days after? The ascension of Jesus Christ. Okay. Acts 1-1. One, one. We're going to read 1-1. One, one. Turn to 1-1. One, one. We're going to read the first six. The firmer treaties have I made, O Theopolis, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after the, that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles, apostles whom he had chosen. Okay? After Jesus' resurrection, he didn't get, I mean, resurrection, he didn't ascend up immediately. We're going to find out how many days he stayed on the earth before he ascended up. Verse 3, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days. And speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water. This is very important. The very last question in here tries to make it out, well, it's named that day because of all the people that were baptized, like water baptism that day. They weren't water baptized that day, okay? It says here, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Many days hence. That's all it says. So far we haven't come across anything that says ten days later, Pentecost. The day of Pentecost. When they therefore were come together, and they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Is to Israel? And he said unto them, It's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. I went a little too far. But will you restore the kingdom? This is just a side note. When I was doing this study, because I had to read First and Second uh, Acts, and would love to do a separate study where it shows that people don't understand Acts is a transition book. And there's a lot of proof in there that talks about Okay, Jesus offered the kingdom to him physically while he was on the earth. Okay, he ascended up. These uh, 11 apostles, they tried to make a 12th one. Uh, there is, uh, Paul is the 12th apostle. They tried to choose and try to deceive God the way America deceives the people. I mean, the, our government deceives the Americans. You know, they pick two people that they want. They don't care which one gets in. It's what they want. And then tell you, you got the freedom to vote and choose. They tried to do the same thing to God. But you have the three apostles, and they turn around and start preaching the kingdom to the Jewish people again, giving them another chance. So the kingdom got put off once, so they went straight to the Jews and started preaching to the Jews. The, the kingdom got put off a second time. And the third time that that kingdom's going to happen, it's going to happen. Okay, it's not getting put off anymore. When Jesus comes back to rule and reign for a thousand years, that kingdom is going to happen. Okay, he's going to rule with the rod of rod of iron. That's a whole other study, but I was reading through that and found that and thought that was very interesting that when you read the first two chapters, that kind of gives you an understanding that they're preaching the kingdom. They're skipping the time of Jacob's trouble, and they're trying to say, hey, we're trying to preach the kingdom. Receive Jesus Christ so the kingdom can come in. They're still preaching to the Jewish people. There's Jews present. Okay. It's not until later that after they completely reject him again, that they go, Paul says, goes to Paul, because this is Peter, goes to Paul, and Paul says, I'm going to go to the Gentiles from this day forward. Now we have to wait till the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Then we have the time of Jacob's trouble. It's not avoidable anymore. 
I believe there might have been a chance to avoid it if they had just accepted Jesus Christ as a nation then, but they still rejected him as a nation, as a whole. There's no avoiding the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? But here we see the 40 days. Then it says so many days after, that's when the day of Pentecost happens. Where do they get the 10 days? Well, if you look it up, this for you, if you look up Whit Sunday, it has to happen on a certain day every year. Because so many days before Whit Sunday is Easter, we'll probably get into that, Easter, and then so many days after is Trinity. They want these days to fall under the same uh, pagan calendar, the pagan days, that they had their pagan practices. And they changed the name of the pagan practices to get you, uh, you to say, as a Christian, to get Christians, false Christians mostly, but even saved, get followers into this trap of doing something that's not based in Scripture. Remember the difference between holy day and, sa and holiday. Holy day is God ordained. God tells you when to do it, how to do it, why you do it, and the consequences for not doing it. There's no such thing as a Christian holiday. I've been trying to just really beat that into some of the brethren. There's no such thing. Chapter and verse. You won't find it in Scripture. Holiday is man-ordained. Man says when to do it, why you do it, how you do it. And they even have their own consequences oftentimes. If you don't celebrate Whit Sunday, you're, you're lost. You're a heretic. If you don't believe in the Trinity, you're lost. You're a heretic. Chapter and verse from the word, and capital T Trinity is a title for God. How can I believe in something that's not in Scripture and be considered a heretic? It's not in Scripture. You see how that works? brothers and sisters of Christ? Okay. But where do we get the ten days afterwards? And it happens, it just so happens, to fall on a Sunday, first day of the week. It is the seventh Sunday after Easter, when you look it up online, because like, you won't find it in Scripture, I had to look up online, Easter. Okay. And I had to say, oh boy, Easter is a pagan holiday, and it's not always on the same day every year. Let that sink in. The day of Pentecost is on the same day every year. It's the day of Pentecost. Unless, I mean, it's the same day every year. Because even in the pay, uh, Jewish calendar, they would, I think it's every three years they skip a month. It doesn't matter, but it's still on the same month, the same day. It's going to be the day of Pentecost. That's when it happens. It doesn't move. But Whit Sunday does. Let that sink in. Okay? Whit Sunday is based off the seventh day after Easter. It's based off Easter. Okay? Easter moves around. It's not the same day every year. Why? Because it's based off of paganism. Easter is not Christian in any way, shape, or form. Okay? Let that sink in when it comes to Whit Sunday. Whit Sunday is not on the same Sunday every year. It moves around too. Then we find out that uh, the, when we get into the Trinity Day, the Trinity Day is not on the same day every year. It moves around because it's based off of seven days after Whit Sunday, which is seven days after Easter, and Easter is always moving around because Easter is a pagan holiday, summer solstice and stuff like that. Okay. In England, it took on some characteristics. I'm reading, I copied some stuff when you look up. In England, it took on some characteristics of Biltane, which originates from the pagan celebration of Summer's Day. Okay. The beginning of the summer, half year, in Europe. Whitsuntide, the week following Whitsunday, was one of three vacation weeks for the medieval uh, Valene. On most manners, he was free from service on the Lord's Demises this week, which marked a pause in the agriculture year. Whit Monday, the day after Whit Sun, so there's not just a Whit Sun, there's a Whit Mun. Monday, remained a holiday in Britain until 1971, with effect from when, with effect from 1972, it was replaced with the spring bank holiday on the last Monday in May. Wit was the occasion for varied forms of celebration. In the northwest of England, church and chapel parades called Wit Walks still take place at this time, sometimes on Wit Friday. The Friday after Whit Sunday. So you have a Whit Sunday, Whit Monday, and a Whit Friday. There's only one day of Pentecost. Pentecost. One day. If Whit Sunday means day of Pentecost, why is there more than one Whit? 
Let that sink in too. It's all based off of paganism. Typically, typically, the parade includes brass bands and choirs, girls attending are dressed in white, traditionally, wit fairs, sometimes called wits sun ales, took place, other costumes, or other customs, I'm sorry, I said it wrong, other customs such as Morse dancing were associated with Whitson, although in most cases they have been transferred to the spring bank holiday, Wadon. Cambridge Shire has its own Whit Sun tradition of singing a unique song around the village before and on Whit Sunday itself. Okay? And then you read the history of Whit Sunday. Let's see if I got it up here. One of these. Here it is. As the first holiday of the summer, this is the history of the word Whitsun. Okay? As the first holiday of the summer, Whitsun was one of the, of the favorite times in the traditional calendar, and Whit Sunday, or the following week, was a time for celebration. This took the form of feeds, fairs, pageants, and parades, with Whitsun ales and Morse dancing in the South. Drinking and dancing. I don't know if that really means ales like dancing, but. Uh, parish ale or church ale was a party or festival in the England parish as which ale was the chief drink. So yeah, drinking and dancing. The south of England and wit walks, club days, and walks in the north. So that's a pagan, a pagan practice, so we want to keep it. So we're going to try to make it a Christian holiday. And we're going to say it's the day of Pentecost. Okay, and you keep reading through it, okay? It's pagan. It's pagan in origin. Okay. Now... They're trying to say what festival, and I noticed they were being honest. If you actually read the question that I asked, that they asked, it says, what festival of the Jews corresponds with this day? It says corresponds. doesn't mean that Whit Sun has anything to do with the day of Pentecost. It just says corresponds. Well, the day of Pentecost is on the same day of Whit Sun. No, it is not. No, it is not. I just showed you, or told you, and you can look it up, that it's seven days. What's sun? Seven days after, um, we just said Easter. And then the Trinity Sunday is seven days after what's sun. But Easter moves around. It's not the same day. Day of Pentecost is the same day. There's no moving around. Okay. So they even admit it just corresponds. They start out by saying it corresponds. But by the time they get done, they want you to believe that what's sun is the same thing as day of Pentecost. They're the same thing. Christians can celebrate Whitson. It's okay. Question. What event commemorates on this day? This is when they start going into the Bible and trying to make it out to be Whitson. Just with those first two questions and you look up the information, you realize this has nothing to do with a Christian. What's a Christian doing having anything to do with this? So the question he asks is, what event is commemorated on this day? Okay. Now my first question, before we get into the answer, the question I wanted to throw right back at the people who wrote this is this. It says, what event is commemorated on this day? What day are you talking about? Day of Pentecost or Whitsunday? Whitsunday. You just said up there, it corresponds on the same day. So now which one are you talking about? They don't say. They make it out. Now this is where they're trying to transform. They slowly bring them together and try to make them out like they're the exact same thing. And they're not. Uh -huh. What event is commemorated on this day? Which day are you talking about? Whit Sunday or Pentecost? They just happen to happen on the same day, but they're not the same thing. Their answer says the descent of the Holy Ghost on the apostles in the shape of tongues of fires. And it says Acts 2 2. Okay. Um, turn to Acts 2 1 actually. Now, Whit Sunday, this has nothing to do with it. Now, if you're talking about the day of Pentecost, we don't know what day that was. Well, all we have is 40 days, unless someone can show me in Scripture, maybe it was prophesied when Jesus was walking so many days after I leave, you guys will get the Holy Spirit. Maybe I'm missing that. But all I found was 40 days. And then they're saying 10 days after that. They're trying to force it to fall on a Sunday. And they're trying to say 10 days later, where's that at in Scripture? I couldn't find it in Scripture. 
Right? But they're saying the descent of the Holy Ghost on the apostles in the shape of tongues of fire. Now, the day of Pentecost, that's true. <laughs> Sorry, I thought I was going to sneeze for a first second. Day of Pentecost, that's true. So Acts 2, 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house with where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. Verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Right. So where do they get that? The descent. Like I said, there's deception there. Remember the question they asked. What event is created on this day? First they go back to the second question they asked. What festival of the Jews corresponds with this day? In other words, what else happens on this day besides Whit Sunday? Then they come back with the question, what event is commemorated on this day? Now they're trying to you, you link the two like they're one. They're the same thing. They're not. Right. So that's what happened on the day of Pentecost. The next question they ask, what filled the house where they were sitting? Well, we just read it there. Their answer said, a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. That's nice, but what's going on here? They're going to start saying a lot of questions that are backed by Scripture, and then turn around and say, it's Whit Sunday, we should all be celebrating it. See, I've proven it with Scripture. No, they've proved the day of Pentecost happened. One thing that they have failed, and they will always fail, like with Christmas, with Easter, with Day of Pente uh, with Whit Sunday, where in Scripture is God saying, okay, this is now a day that's going to be a holy day, and He tells you when to keep it, how to keep it, why you keep it, and the consequences for not keeping it. Where is that at in Scripture? You won't find it. This was a day that's to be remembered, but we're not supposed to be turning it into a national holiday. I always say national, but uh, a holiday like the, we have to keep it every year. We've got to keep it. Chapter and verse. It's not there. It's something to be remembered. Everything in here is for our learning. We're to learn from it. Because right. the next, because uh, like I said Acts two two, it's what it said. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. That's in scripture. That's truth. That question, what filled the house where they were sitting? The day of Pentecost, people were sitting, or the Whit Sun people were sitting. See what's the difference? They're trying to link it together. The next question: For what purpose was the Holy Ghost sent? This one, the answer says, to teach the apostles and to bring all things to their remembrance and give them courage to preach the gospel. Wait a second. The 40 days that Jesus was on the earth, he was teaching the apostles and telling them what they were supposed to be preaching and teaching. Hmm. The Holy Ghost comes in and guides us into all truth. Today, the Holy Ghost is going to teach us this and is going to line up with this because this is God's perfect written word. It's no longer, this is my feeling, like in the Old Testament, the Holy Ghost would speak through people, and it's as good as God's Word. Today, if I say, thus saith the Lord, it better line up with Scripture. There is no, well, it might not be in here, but the Holy Ghost told me it's true. It might not be in here, but I had a dream and everything. No. Dreams, near-death experiences, whatever. It better line up with Scripture today. Okay? But I wanted to throw that in there. They start teaching the apostles. Now, don't get me wrong. The Holy Ghost guides us into all truth. It opens this book to us and helps us to learn this book. It gives us wisdom. We ask God for wisdom. He gives it to us through the Holy Ghost. Okay? That's there. But they leave out that part where Jesus was there for 40 days preaching and teaching. Those people, the 11 apostles. Okay? And here's the thing, in those 40 days, if Jesus wanted one of those two apostles, that's just backtracking a little bit, that just came to my, my, my heart, my head and my heart. When you go through there and they're trying to pick out those two disciples, okay, we got these two, we're going to draw lots, and they're going to be the 12th apostle to replace Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus Christ. Jesus walked with them, for those same people were there, for 40 days. If Jesus wanted one of them to be the 12th apostle, he would have ordained him himself. 
Think about that one. That one people don't really talk about. Think about that. Okay? Just another thing. But, um... But yes, the Holy Ghost will teach us and guide us into all truth. Absolutely, I'm not saying that. But when you read it, Jesus was there teaching them and told them what to do. And then they're sitting there waiting for the Holy Ghost. Okay. John 7.37. Turn to John 7.37. Just a little tidbit of information. Don't leave that out. That Jesus was still there physically teaching for 40 days before he left. Then they got the Holy Spirit. John 7, 37. Oops. Okay. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Verse 39. But this spake he of the Spirit, which that they that believed on believe on him should receive for the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified this is just reading this saying they didn't have the Holy Ghost then Jesus came and preached and taught to him for 40 days after the resurrection now they're gonna get the Holy Spirit so what happens after they get the Holy Spirit teaching the Apostles John 16 12 I'm trying to grab from John the Old Testament where Jesus is prophesying this that this is gonna happen okay. 16 12 I have many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Why? Because they don't have the Holy Spirit to guide them into all truth. Verse 13, Howbeit, when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth. For He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He, sh he shall hear. In other words, He's passing on the words of Jesus Christ. They're one and the same. So I don't want to get in that again, but Jesus said, I will be with you. Here is saying the Holy Spirit's going to be with you. Okay, we get the Holy Spirit, and then it talks about the hidden man of the heart. If we're talking about the women, uh, you have Jesus Christ in you. We have Jesus Christ in us, but who do? But we have the Holy Spirit in us. That's one and the same. Here it is. The Holy Spirit only speaks what Jesus speaks. Okay, what he, whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. It's there. He's prophesying. When you get the Holy Spirit, yeah, you're going to learn. It's going to teach you what to say. Remember that verse talks about don't worry about what to say. The Holy Spirit will give you the words to say. When, when you're in a tight situation or in certain situations, God just gives you the words to say to try to reach somebody. Okay. But there we have that. Then they said uh, to bring all things to remembrance. Where is that at? They don't quote scripture. I don't know why. People just have a hard time with scripture. They really don't like this book. How hard is it to link because it already did link the one up there, it said Acts 2.2, 2, which was actually Acts 2.3, that said, talks about the close of tongues of fire that sat upon them, and then it says they were filled with the Holy Ghost in, in verse 4, but it just said Acts 2.2, 2, so they didn't even have the right reference. <laughs> but how come they didn't reference these sayings when it said, teach the apostles? They could have referenced John, John 7.37, bring all things into remembrance, John 14.26, 14, 26. 14, 26. It says, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, here we see the teaching all things, and bring all things to your remembrance. Whatsoever I have said unto you. Everything that God said unto them, they remembered afterwards. There was a lot of times it says that they remembered this after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm paraphrasing. But there are certain things that they didn't get the full grasp of how important it was until after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay. They got the Holy Spirit. So we see that. They could have done that. Uh, courage to preach the gospel. They put it on there and give courage to preach the gospel. Luke 12, 11. Twelve eleven. And when they bring unto you, let's see, and when they bring you into the, the synagogue and unto magistrates and powers, take ye no thought how or what things ye shall answer or what ye shall say. For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in that same hour what ye ought to say. Oh, yeah. 
Holy Ghost can give us courage. Today, do I still fail? Do I still lack courage sometimes? Go give that person a gospel track. Go talk to that person about Jesus Christ. Yeah, I still fail sometimes. Uh, sometimes you have people that force it. The door's not open and they're forcing it. There's times where there's an open door and you, and you, and you fail. It's going to be there. But God, in a pinch, God's going to give you the, the courage. God's going to give you the right words to say. I didn't put this down in my notes, but a good uh, correlation to this is, remember Paul, when he's preaching to King, um, King Agrippa, okay, that almost put, uh, I want to say it right, that almost convinced me to believe, basically. You almost, got, you almost convinced me to be a believer. Not thou only, but everyone that hears it. Okay? The Holy Ghost will give you uh, courage. 2 Corinthians 12.9. We'll go through some Pauline epistles. 2 Corinthians 12.9. That's first. We need 2 Corinthians. 12 verse 9. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Okay. I read that real quick because uh, we did a study recently talking about it. You want courage. You want strength. you got to realize that my courage is nothing. My strength is nothing. It's God's strength. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Okay? You want the courage to be able to hand out gospel tracts by hand? You want the courage to start talking to people about the, the Word of God? You need to rely on Jesus Christ. Stay in His Word. He'll give you courage. Live a life of Christ. You're going to get so much persecution that God's going to help you build walls to, for the persecution. That shield of faith, the persecution, all the fiery darts. I want to get into the study of the uh, armor of God. Fiery darts, okay, it'll help give you courage when you've got that shield. That shield is Jesus Christ, okay? He's protecting you from all of the fiery darts. When you have faith in His Word, when you have faith in Jesus Christ. Okay. Ephesians 3.13 Acts, Romans, um... 1st and 2nd Corinthians, then it should be Ephesians. No, Galatians. And then Ephesians. I'm trying to do it from memory instead of looking at the tabs. Still a little slow. I'm still a little slow. Ephesians 3.13. Wherefore I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this cause I bow my knee unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man. His capital S Spirit, and there it talks about the inner man, Jesus Christ. Amen. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ with passive knowledge, that ye might be filled with the, all the fullness of God. Now unto the, him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. The Holy Spirit will strengthen you. When the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me, we read right there that to be strengthened with might by His Spirit. There's so much in here that keeps proving the Godhead is the truth. The Godhead is the truth. Jesus is God the Father. Jesus is the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. I can do all things through Christ which strengthen me. No, 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 you got that wrong. It says to be strengthened with the might by His Spirit. Capital S Spirit. It's talking about the Holy Spirit. And then it says, in the inner man. And it goes back to Jesus Christ. Okay? It's there. So, when they're talking about this, it's always, when someone's teaching, you compare with Scripture. They make that statement. To teach the apostles, to bring all things into remembrance, and to give them courage. Okay? 
uh, to preach the gospel. Okay, chapter and verse. They didn't show any chapter and verse to back it up. I just did. Now, the next question that they would ask, question, what did they begin to do at once? Now, the party's like, well, they're not using the Bible. They didn't read the story. They're saying, read these verses. Okay, now we're going to talk about it. Read Acts chapter 1 and 2 where it talks about, you know, Jesus being there for 40 days, the day of Pentecost and everything. They don't tell you to do that and then go through and ask this. But when they ask, what did they begin to do at once? Well, chapter and verse. It's not there. Okay. Remember, back when this was out, not everybody had Bibles. Okay, a family would be lucky to have one Bible per family. The Bible wasn't so readily for everybody. Because remember, we looked at this. This is a very old, old book. Let's see if I can find the date again. 16... I want to say 70. It's very hard to print. It's very small. 16-something. Okay. So, let's say 1700. That's an old book. <laughs> okay. Now this is a reprint. I'm pretty sure it's a reprint after a reprint. You know, this isn't the uh, original. <laughs> it's the original of the original of the original. But this is when this came out. It was back then. Not everybody had Bibles. And not every family, like everybody in the family had a Bible. Only one person had a Bible. Uh, praise the Lord for uh, Brother Alexander Hartley. Uh, lately he's been doing videos where he's sitting there reading the Bible. And it got me thinking... Um, Back in those days, those must have been really good days. I mean, I'm glad, everybody, that you have your own Bible, that you're doing your Bible studies, that you're reading your Bible. But since there was only one Bible in the family, I can imagine them coming together in the evenings. And what people would do nowadays, where they get popcorn and watch, you know, Hollywood movies. Or do other kind of junk. They would come together in the evenings, and one person would read from the Bible, while the rest of them would sit there and listen. They teach the kids how to read from the Bible. They might have even taken turns reading from the Bible, but while one person was reading it, the rest of them were sitting there listening. How's that for a pastime? That's to me would be a great pastime. I do that. I play Alexander Scorvey a lot in the evenings, sitting out there, talking with the Lord on the deck in the evenings, and I sit there and I listen to the Word of God in the evenings. That's my pastime. My time with the Lord and His Word. Okay. And then there's times where I read it myself. But I'll sit there and listen and talk to the Lord. Oh, he just said this. This reminds me of this over here, Lord. And he said that. And I'll be talking with the Lord in my head and my heart. Okay, hiding God's word in your heart. Okay, Lord, I need to make sure I'm doing that. What he just said there. Oh, I need to stay away from that. You know, that's there. Some people forget about that. But what did they begin to do at once? Well, if you read First Acts, Acts uh, chapter 1 and 2, you realize that they're talking about the speaking in tongues. So their answer was to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now Acts 2, 4. Get back to Acts. Number 1 and 2. That's where they're getting a lot. That's where you're going to find the day of Pentecost. Acts 1 and 2. Uh, 2 is the day of Pentecost, but Acts 1 is the preparation for Pentecost. Jesus teaches for 40 days. It sends up. And then there's a wait there until they receive the Holy Ghost. But Acts 2 4 it says, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. Didn't say unknown tongues. Other tongues. As the Spirit gave them utterance. Capital S Spirit. So when they say, What did they begin to do at once? And they put A, answer, to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance, they could have referenced Acts 2 4. They didn't. Okay. Like I said, people say, well, come on, it's not that big of a deal. It's not that big. It's all about getting you away from the Word of God. They don't reference the Word, because if they reference it, that means you're supposed to go look it up to make sure that what they're telling you is the truth. That's why you reference it. That's why when you get books that have lots of references, it's because they want you to know that I'm telling the truth. This doesn't have hardly any references, it, and you're supposed to accept this as absolute truth. The next question was, the question and answer was, what did this assembly, what did this enable them to do? Now, the answer says, to preach the gospel to all nations in all languages. Chapter and verse on that one. Okay. This is a one-time event. 
We'll get to that. Acts 2, 7. You get to Acts chapter 2, verse 7. And we're going to read that all the way down to 11. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthens and Medes and Elmites and the dwellings of Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes. Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. So yes, were they preaching the gospel in every tongue? Absolutely. Okay, one time event. Now we're going to get to the few, uh, we're going to get further down where it talks about how some people have a gift of speaking in tongues. Okay, there are gifts that God gives people where they can learn multiple languages. Okay, but they're saying that at this point, these apostles could speak any language, anytime, anywhere, anyhow. There's a one-time event that's going on right here. Now, I'm not saying that they couldn't, that God, I'm not limiting God. But when you make a statement like that, chapter and verse where they keep going on and preaching different languages to everybody. No, they kept going to the Jewish people. And preaching the, uh, the kingdom of the, of the Lord, the day of the Lord, the kingdom, to the Jewish people. And they rejected it a second time. It was Paul that went to the Gentiles. Okay. Paul had a gift of speaking in tongues. He was a Roman citizen as well as a Jewish citizen. But one thing God pointed out to me last night, which is great in my day of read reading, was if you turn over to John chapter 7, 33. We'll start at 33. John 7, 33. Then said Jesus unto them, Yet a little while... And yet a little while am I with you, and then I go unto him that sent me. Remember the 40 days after the death, burial, resurrection? He preached for 40 days, then he went up. Right. Verse 34. Ye shall seek me, and shall not find me, and where I am, thither ye cannot come. Then said the Jews among themselves, Whither will he go, that we shall not find him? Now look at what they're thinking. Will he go into the dispersed among the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles? What manner of saying is this that he said, Ye shall seek me and shall not find me, and where I am, thither ye cannot come. Okay. I'll stop there. The main thing there is it says, Will he go will he go unto the dispersed among the Gentiles? What's the dispersed talking about? Jews. Jews weren't just in Jerusalem, they were dispersed everywhere. And then when you come right here, it says all these people are hearing them in our tongue. It doesn't mean that they're Gentiles necessarily. There were Jews that were living in other countries, dispersed among the Gentiles. They had to live, they started living like the Gentiles. They started speaking like the Gentiles. Okay? So be careful here. There are Jews that they're preaching to. Um, If you keep going down, of, on uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 17 through 20, he's preaching the kingdom again to the Jewish people. Okay. He's still bringing that key, a kingdom to the Jewish people. That whole event was for a sign for the Jewish people. It was for the uh, apostles to get the Holy Spirit, and it was done in the way it was done as a sign to the Jewish people. And the tongues that were spoken were known languages, and the people that were hearing those known languages, were, I believe, were the Jews that were dispersed out throughout all the Gentiles that we read right here. Will he go to the dispersed among the Gentiles? Okay. They're still breathing. Uh, Paul, uh, Peter, is still trying to preach to the Jewish people. Because then it said, but Peter, standing up with the, the eleven, lifted up his voice. It's verse 14, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 2, verse 14. But Peter, standing up and with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, 
And all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. Okay. And it says, for, the, for these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the 17 he goes into it. Gentiles, if they said, this was spoken by the prophet Joel, the Gentiles would have been like, Joel? Who's Joel? I have no clue what you're talking about. I don't know that man, and I don't know you. What are you talking about? See what I'm saying? He's preaching to the Jews. The Jews will go, Joel, I know who Joel is. He's a prophet. Spoken by the prophet Joel. The Old Testament, Testament prophecies. Okay. Uh, turn to 1 Corinthians 12, 20... Seven. Just got to get this out. I'm not saying that the Holy Ghost can't help someone speak in another language, known language. But this is how he does it. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. For today. We don't require a sign. We seek after wisdom, and that's what gets us messed up, because we seek after our own wisdom. When it says that the Gentiles seek after wisdom, or, uh, yeah, Gentiles, or the Greeks seek after wisdom, we try to seek out for wisdom here, our own wisdom. We're not seeking God's wisdom. But that's what we're trying to push today. God's wisdom. Not my wisdom, God's. It's about God's word. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now ye are the body of Christ and the members in particular. And God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondary prophets, thirdly teachers. I'm the thirdly. Okay? And I am also the secondary to a point. Okay? We're all prophets when we prophesy, preach the plan of salvation, and we tell people if you reject Jesus Christ, you'll go to hell and burn for all eternity. That's called a future prophecy. That's what prophets do. When we tell, warn people that Jesus is coming back any day now, He's coming to get us, that's future prophecy. The time of Jacob's trouble is about to be, come upon us. That's future prophecy. We tell people about the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ, the new heavens and the new earth. That's future prophecy. Are we prophets? Uh, we're being shown this from Scripture. But if you're talking about prophets as far as them being able to, prof I can tell you what's going to happen tomorrow, that's not here. Okay? As far as specifics, first apostles, secondary prophets, thirdly, teachers. We always call, some of them say, well, there's pastors, there's preachers, there's teachers. They're all just teachers. You have bishops, you have deacons. Okay. I fall under the third, I'm just a teacher. I preach what God teaches me and shows me, and I try to encourage the body of Christ to keep their eyes on Jesus Christ, and let's get that last soul saved. To encourage you to stand, 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 not be part of the falling away that we see happening today. First it says, and after that, miracles, then gifts of healing. You know, teachers, everything's got to line up with the Word of God. Then it says, after that, miracles. So the miracles line up with the Word of God. Then gifts of healing. It's talking about physical healing. People can, can learn herbal medicinals. They can learn how to set bones. They get really good at it. They can do things that really help people healing-wise. I mean, you had Luke, the physician, that, I think it was Luke, that followed uh, Paul around for a while when he was sick. Helps. Okay, you have people in the body of Christ that are supposed to be helping. Okay. Governments, diversity of tongues. It's there. Now here's the thing that gets this, because right there they're trying to make it out where they can do it anytime they want, all they wanted. And this is the part where I'm saying I believe it's a one-time event. From that point forward, they went back to the Jews, preaching the Jew to the Jews the kingdom of God. Peter did. And then Peter was given visions and told to go to a Gentile's house, and then God started bringing the Gentiles into it because the Jewish people were rejecting him yet again. Okay? But verse 29, are all apostles... Question mark. Are all prophets? Question mark. Are all teachers? Question mark. Are all workers of miracles? Question mark. Have all the gifts of healing? Question mark. Do all speak with tongues? There's what we're talking about right now. Question mark. Do all interpret? Question mark. But covet earnestly the best gifts. In other words, the answer is no. But 
covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. Whatever gifts God gives you, covet it and go hardcore on it. God's given me a gift that I'm trying my best to teach the Word of God and to encourage the brethren. I give God the glory for that. But I do well to take your strengths that God gives you and go with it. Okay. If you are starting to do some studies in medicinal uh, herbal med medicines and um, how to set bones, how to do childbirthing at home, and you're doing all this stuff, make, make some videos on it. Go with it. God's given you that. Teach that stuff. But more importantly, do that stuff. Some of the brethren out there have done it. Okay. They know who they are. Uh, so I want to show that to you. So right there it says, What does this enable them to do? To preach the gospel to all the nations and all languages. Uh, that day it was. They were remember they were preaching... See if we can find it. There it is. To hear, do hear them speak in our language the wonderful works of God. Gospel is in there. I know it was. That's the wonderful works of God. But there's more to it. Okay. All the great things that Jesus did. That's what they were profounding to him. All the things. Jesus' earthly ministry. All the great things that Jesus did. And ultimately dying to pay for the sins of the world. Not the individual. The world. You want your individual sins paid for? As far as you want that debt wiped clean? You've got to go to the cross in a repentant state. Personal, godly sorrow. Sorrow towards God in your heart for your personal sins that you've sinned against Him. Understanding the consequences and that heartfelt sorrow is, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to live like this anymore. I don't want to sin against God anymore. I'm a mess. Lord, what do I do? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Okay? He points you to the cross. They spoke all the great things he did. Not just the gospel, I believe everything. The whole workings that Jesus did, the, the virgin birth, all the way up. They just kept speaking all these great things that Jesus did. Right? The wonderful works, plural. Next question that they ask. By what other name does Christ call the Holy Spirit? Okay. We all know, know this. Uh, what's the other word? A lot of us should know it. Okay? The Comforter, who shall teach them all things. Things. <laughs> things. I left out the H. Um, when you type really fast, sometimes you get letters switch around. Sometimes you, it doesn't register that you hit a letter. So learning how to type is great, but learning, but type, trying to type really fast, you start making mistakes. But the Comforter, but there's no reference. They just say it. it's the comfortable. You're just taking their word for it. Well, here's the reference. Turn to John 14, 16. John 14, 16. We're going to read all the way through 26. We already read some of it already, but we'll read it again. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him. No, it doesn't say ye seeth him, but ye know him. He's talking about himself. Okay, you know, you know me? You know the Holy Spirit. For he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Once again, a lot of these passages I have highlighted for the Godhead. The Holy Ghost is going to be with you. And then Jesus says, I will be with you. Jesus is in heaven right now. Okay, He's preparing a place for us. But here it says he's going to be with you. Everywhere you go, I will be with you. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. The body. But ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in the Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. This is another verse. For a whole other, the other study I said, brothers, says Christ, 
<laughs> Jesus said, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will come unto him, and we will make our abode with him. The mark of someone who truly loves Jesus Christ, which is the mark of someone who's truly saved, is they're going to do their best to keep the word of God. The written word of God. Here we see it again. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, not just have them, there's so many professing, Bible-believing Christians out there, God-fearing men and women, that have the commandments of God, but they don't keep them. They still are part of this whole movement that you can have the world and be a Christian. It says you have to keep them. He it is that loveth me. Now, real quick, because people always say I'm like hardcore, you got to be sinless. I still fail the Lord. I just said, I'm, I have so much burnt up at the judgment seat of Christ. I have fallen flat on my face several times in my walk with the Lord. I have made mistakes. I have sinned. But what's my heart's desire? My heart's desire is to keep them. And it's reflected by the life I live. I fall flat on my face. God picks me back up and gets me back on the right path. Gets me back to obeying His commandments. That's the life of a Christian, someone who's truly saved. But today you have a lot of people who fight that. Okay? And they'll say, well, I have the commandments, but it says, and keepeth them. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manif manifest myself to him. You know, you're, when your walk with the Lord is strong, that's when God tends to show you a lot. You are weak, but your walk with the Lord is strong. What does that mean? Your life you make your home a Bible-believing, God-fearing home, same from all appearance of evil home. You make sure that you're living right and you're doing right. You're eating right. You're healthy. You're getting out doing good works that, with your hands and everything, things that you can glorify God. You're always glorifying God in everything. You're giving Him credit in everything. You're giving Him thanks in everything. When your walk is strong with the Lord, that's when the Lord tends to show you a lot. Okay? 22, Judas saith unto him, Not Iscariot, Lord, not Iscariot, I'm sorry, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. There's where it's at. And my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. In other words, anybody can have the Holy Spirit. They have to get saved. They have to obey the gospel. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which he hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Okay. The Holy Spirit. Another name for the Holy Spirit is the Comforter. But the Holy Spirit is like, you're just going to give it to us? Day of Pentecost, it's only for us? It's to anybody who, be, who will repent and believe. That God saves and says, I'm giving you, I'm sending the Comforter now. You're one of mine. I'm sending the Comforter to be with you. Jesus said, I will be with you. There's a lot in that passage. You get teachings on multiple things in that passage alone. How important the Word of God is. Okay, true love for Jesus Christ is keeping His commandments. It's keeping His Word. If you don't have the perfect written word of God, how can you love Jesus Christ? You're not capable of it. It's not possible. And if you don't love Jesus Christ, how can you get the comforter? The first thing you keep is you obey the gospel. You come to God broken in a repented state. And you believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Okay, it's the first step towards obeying, the loving Jesus Christ, obeying the gospel. He commanded every man everywhere to repent. At this time God winked at, but now commanded every man everywhere to repent. God's will is that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's a command to repent before salvation. And you got a lot of people that take that out. That's me going off in a whole other direction. Okay? But the Comforter, they could, there's the scriptures to back that another word for the Holy Spirit is the Comforter. Okay. Now, here's what they say. Question, what is the office of the Holy Spirit? I forgot, there's still one more question before they go back to trying to say Whit Sunday is all about Pentecost. So far they've gone through, they've asked good questions, and they've given answers, but they didn't give references here. It's about man's words, it's not about pointing you to here. If 
For man love me, he will keep my words. We're always supposed to point you to hear the perfect written word of God, King James Bible for English speaking people. What is the office of the Holy Spirit? Their answer is to reprove and convince the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And they say John 16, 8. Turn to John 16, 7. Okay. And we're going to read through 10. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter, what's that referring to? The Holy Spirit, we've read that, will not come unto you, but if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, of sin, because they believe not on me. Okay. 10. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and ye see me no more. 11. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. And that's where it goes on, verse 12. I have yet many things to say unto you, yet ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit when the Spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. We read that before. Okay. There's where they get this. Okay. And you read it, guide us into all truth, John 16, 13. We read that one. Howbeit, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. The Holy Spirit comes along and convicts people. He bears witness with their conscience and convicts them and lets them know that they are sinners. The law is a schoolmaster and brings us to Christ. Okay? The letter killeth. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The Holy Spirit is omnipresent, it's everywhere, everyone gets convicted at one point in time. Now when they get convicted, do they turn to Jesus Christ and have godly sorrow, sorrow for their personal sins, or when they get convicted, do they have worldly sorrow and just reject Jesus Christ and go left? Jesus Christ or the world? Godly sorrow, worldly sorrow. Everybody, I believe, has gotten convicted at one point in their life when it comes to sin. That's what the Holy Ghost does. Okay. Romans 8.1. Turn to Romans 8.1. There is therefore, therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. The Spirit comes along and, convi and convicts the world of sin. When you get saved, the proof that that conviction, that you actually followed the Spirit, and that conviction, and not the world, like turned to the world and had worldly sorrow, is that you're going to walk after the Spirit. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. There's the law of sin and death when you get saved. Here's something i got to throw out there. This is what we're trying to stay with Whit Sunday, but sometimes it's hard because you want to talk about these things. Here's the thing that I, it's a whole other teaching, but people say, I've been freed from the law of sin and death. But here's the thing. You've been freed from the law of sin and death, but now you're under a different law. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of the Spirit of death, of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit, capital S. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God. There's what I was looking for. You go from being under the law of sin and death to being under the law of God. You are not free, free as like you're just free to do whatever you want, live however you want, and be whoever you want. When you get saved, you are liberated, liberty, you are liberated from the law of sin and death, and now you are put under the law of God. He owned you. He purchased you. Feed the church of God with the purchase with his own blood. 
The Holy Spirit comes in and starts telling you what to do. The commandments of God starts teaching you through the Word. His Word, His commandments, the do's and the don'ts, the doctrines. He even starts teaching about the future events, what's going to happen in the future. Okay? You're under the law of God. You belong to God now. You're not a free person to take off and do whatever you want now. I can sin all I want. Am I supposed to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Right? Neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. And then if you keep reading, we, let's see, I was supposed to read to nine. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. If. There's that if. I was like he's talking to the Corinthians. You know, had a lot of false converts in 1st and 2nd Corinthians. If, that the, so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, Christ be in you. The body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Capital S, Spirit, is life because of righteousness. But the Spirit of him that raised him from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by the, his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brother, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. So when they say there that... Uh, what is the office of the Holy Spirit to reprove and convince the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment? That's there, absolutely. But the, what about the office of, of what's the Holy Spirit's, how it works in a, in a saved person? It guides us into all truth. Well, we just read the, it teaches us how to walk after the Spirit. We get, we're spiritually minded, the Holy Spirit comes in, it commands us, Jesus Christ is our commander, He's our King, He's our Lord, the capital L Lord, Jesus Christ. He tells us what to do. We belong to Him. And we start walking after the Spirit. Our life lines up with the Holy Spirit, with the Word of God, when He opens the Word of God. If someone's life doesn't line up with the Word, something's not right. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Word and deed. Here's the words. Where's the deeds? The Holy Spirit's in you. He's going to lead you into those deeds, doing good things according to Scripture. See, they talk about the office of how the Holy, the Holy Ghost convicts the world of sin. It's there. But the Holy Ghost comes into us to keep us separate from the world from this point on. Be ye separate. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What's the renewing of your mind? We just read it right there. You go from carnally minded to spiritually minded. The renewing of your mind. There's a change. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. There's a change in here and here, and it's reflected by the life you're living. The life changes. Right. Kind of went off a little bit on there, but back to the main part of the study. Wit Sunday. Okay, I just was answering the questions, and I wanted to give you the questions based off Scripture, not just off people's words. Well, if they say it, it's got to be true. That's, the, that's a bad practice, brothers and sisters of Christ. Always compare Scripture with Scripture. The last question, this is where they try to they preach all this truth. You can't find it in Scripture. We did. We looked all through Scripture. Great Bible study. And then they come and try to bring it back to Whit Sunday, which is not in Scripture, and say it's the same thing. So everybody, right there, we just proved lots of Scripture. We just proved this is absolute truth. you got to abide, abide by Whit Sunday. How many people, do? how many of them do that with... Um, the Trinity. They grab all these verses that are true, but any time they try to say, well, that proves the Trinity, it doesn't, because the Trinity is not there. That proves God in three persons. It doesn't, because God in three persons is not there. Jesus Christ is the person singular of the Godhead. He's the only person of the Godhead. One person. A person has to have a body, soul, and spirit, according to Scripture. It has to be alive. Okay, you don't refer to someone who's dead as a person. You can refer to them when they were living as a person, but present tense, if that person's dead, they're no longer, I mean, if that person's dead, if he or she is dead, they're no longer a person. Okay? And he can be a reference to things like trees. You look in the Old Testament, they always try to grab he's. See, it says he here, that's a person. Well, sometimes it says he or she for animals. 
and it says he or she for trees. I think it says he for a tree. Um, referring to a tree. And it's like, uh, these aren't persons. So you can't grab he and she and say, well, that's a person. You have to have the actual word person. But that's their whole mindset. They'll grab verses that sound good, grab verses that teach certain things, and then they'll say, well, now, see, that proved. Right here, question. Why was the festival called Whit Sunday? Festival, we just read it on here, festival. Is the day of Pentecost a festival? No. It's the day of Pentecost. But the, I'm looking over here because I read what I read over here on the computer about Whit Sunday, the origins of Whit Sunday, pagan origins. It was just party time. It's flesh, elevating the flesh, dancing, uh, drinking. Okay, why was this festival called Whit Sunday? Now they say, why was this? And they're referring festival to the day of Pentecost. Because that's all we've been talking about is the day of Pentecost. Right. Answer, Pentecost is German. It is Feinstein. Now right there, it's like, okay, wait a minute. It's Whit Sunday, not Feinstein. But we'll wait. But if you break down Feinstein and we can tweak, tweak it and tweak it, tweak it, then we can find whence comes Weinstein. But wait a minute, that's still not Whit Sunday. Well, wait, wait, we can tweak that a little bit, go back through the language and tweak the language a little bit and say, well, from Weinstein we can get Whitson. And that's how we get Whitson. See how that works? If it's a German, if we're using a German word for uh, Pentecost, it would be Feinstein. According to what I, I'm not a good German, maybe that's not true, but I'm not saying I know how to speak German. I'm just going off some of the things that I've read. If Feinstein truly is German for Pentecost, then why isn't it Feinstein Day? Why is it Wit Sunday? Then, if that's true, remember what we read on here. You have Wit Monday. So you have Pentecost Monday. You have Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost Monday. Pentecost Friday. You see where this is leading? It's all like, there's only one day of Pentecost. That's it. Okay. Others, as if it were white or wit Sunday, suppose its name from the light which fell on the apostles, light fell on them, uh, closed uh, tongues uh, like those of fire, closed in tongues, fell on them. Okay. More light. Every time I hear that, more light, more light. You know, like beams of light fell on them. No. See, now they don't even follow scripture. And from the white garments worn in the primitive church by the many baptized on that day, Okay. It was a, they were baptized with the Holy Ghost, not with water that day. It was the Holy Ghost coming down. They were being baptized by the Holy Ghost. The only thing that will save you is baptism by the Holy Ghost. And what I mean by that is exactly what I said, baptism by the Holy Ghost. We read in there, John baptized with water. Water won't do squat. Everybody says you have to be baptized in the river and you have to be baptized. Water will not do squat. It's an outward showing. It's a sign. The Jews require a sign. It's an outward showing. Baptism by the Holy Ghost is the only thing that's going to save you. Okay. You have baptism with the Holy Ghost or baptism with fire? Heaven or hell? <laughs> What's it going to be? You're going to be baptized. Everybody gets baptized, period. Are you going to be baptized by the Holy Ghost or are you going to be baptized with fire? What's it going to be? Okay. Now, Pentecost in German is Feinstein. Now, I say, well, Whitson, not even there. Okay, they try to back it up, back it up, back it up, so they can claim this pagan holiday. It, it, we can use this Whit Sunday and claim it's the day of Pentecost and get Christians to celebrate a pagan holiday just trying to disguise it as a Christian holiday. Remember, there's no such thing as a Christian holiday. No such thing. Every time you see someone say, it's a Christian holiday, and you look at it, you're going to find out it's actually paganism. Christmas, a Christian holiday, paganism. Easter, Christians can celebrate Easter, and we can Christianize it, make it a Christian holiday. It's pagan. They're now even trying to turn Halloween into a Christian holiday, trying to Christianize it, make it a certain area where we do it this way, which makes it Christian. It's paganism. Proven. Okay. Anytime you hear holiday... It's man-ordained. It's going to be based off paganism in the world every time. Now, holy day, you'll find that in Scripture. 
there's a lot of holy days, and some holy days fell on Sabbath days. Okay? So you have Sabbath days and holy days. That is scripture. That's something a Christian, if they want to, they can observe that day. Go for it. But when you got people coming out and saying, hey, here's Whit Sunday, this just by the first couple questions, you start going scratching your head, going, wait a second, it doesn't tell us what day exactly the day of Pentecost was. Someone can prove me wrong in scripture. Because I, like I said, I looked where I could in the first part, but I could miss something. But it doesn't give us the exact day. The only number it gives us is 40 days Jesus was on the earth after his resurrection, preaching and teaching to the apostles and the disciples that were with him. The people that were with him. Okay? For 40 days. But we don't get that day. Why do they get that day? Why do they push that day? Because they want, they have their pagan holidays that fall on these certain days. And all these pagan holidays are based off of Easter. When you actually look at it, it seems like they're all based off of Easter. Like I said, you have Easter. Seven days after Easter, you've got Whit Sunday. It's supposed to be the day of Pentecost. And then Easter Sunday is supposed to be Risen Sunday. And it's not. And then the, when we get to the next study, a week after that, you get um, the Trinity Sunday. Okay? It's all based off of paganism, false gods. The Trinity is based off of false gods. It's been proven time and time again. Trinity and God in three persons and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. When you add more than one God, the Bible says there's only one capital G, God the Father. 1 Corinthians 8, 6. And nobody, nobody can refute that. They have to try to ignore it or explain it away and act like it doesn't exist. Basically, they're just saying it's a lie. It's wrong. The Bible says there's but one capital G, God the Father, that's wrong. Because we have God the Son, and we have God the Holy Spirit. They have to add all these false gods. That's what this stuff traces back to. Trinity traces back to Whit Sunday, which traces back to e Easter, which traces back to Roman paganism. Catholicism, which is Roman paganism. Okay. So I had to do this before we get into the Trinity Sunday. Okay that this book tries to teach. And I just wanted to do this because this is what they're trying to teach kids. And this is right here is what I believe we have such a hard time in the body of Christ today when they're trying to hold on to the uh, words. They believe the Godhead of the Bible, but some of them are still holding on to the phrases of the Trinity, the terms of the Trinity, these terms, that term. It's because of this garbage right here being taught to the kids way back when. Catholicism still trying to keep Christians under their rule and trying to hold them and rein them in and say, okay, we've lost track of them so far. They have the Word of God. They've got this. they got that. Let's give them this instead. Now, this in here, when I come to think about it, it's got to be a different date than that I'm reading. <laughs> like I, said, I just can't read it. I think it could be 1870 or 1670. It still could be. Because I'm thinking 1611, the King James Bible came out, and then this came out in 1670. It's them trying to grab them and still try to hold on to those who escaped and got away from the Catholic Church. They're trying to infiltrate and bring everybody back under the authority of Rome. This is what they're getting that jump from. They're not getting it from here. They're getting Trinity when we get to it. Trinity from this junk here and not here. Okay. Babel buildings. <laughs> Babel buildings, we talk about it. They're getting it from this junk here. They're not getting it from here. Today, there's no Babel buildings in here. There's no temples made with hands, God's man's hands. Okay? Your body is a temple for the Holy Ghost. The, blood, the church is the people. And you meet anywhere and everywhere. You don't build a specific building and say, we're going to title this building a church. And when anybody questions that, we'll tell them, well, no, it's the people. When we really believe it's the building, because we treat the building as a church, and then we invite both saved and lost to it. Where is it at in Scripture? It's not there, but you'll find it in this junk over here. And then you have people dare, dare to say that they're Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women when they're following this junk over here, and they're not following the Word of God. If you had anything to do with Whit Sunday, get away from it. It has nothing to do. It's just the day of Pentecost is a day that we don't know the exact day. Once again, if God wanted us to celebrate it, He would have told us when, how, why, and there would be consequences for not doing it. 
That's what a holy day is. That's the biblical definition of what a holy day is. Every time there's a holy day, you have those four things present. Okay? Every time. Okay? It's not there. So, we're going to end this study. And hopefully this has encouraged you, brethren, to focus on the Word of God. When someone comes to you and says, Hey, thus saith the Lord. You're like, you need to have the attitude of, Oh, really? Chapter and verse. Oh, don't, don't, don't worry about the book. I mean, you, you kind of worship a piece of paper. Just go off of what I say. Just trust me. Thus saith the Lord. Chapter and verse. You know what? You're starting to be a problem. You know that? You've got to be stubborn, brothers and sisters from Christ, and keep coming back with chapter and verse. Chapter and verse. It's got to be backed by Scripture, comparing Scripture with Scripture with Scripture. Okay? So grace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you, which is in, in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay. Thank you for watching.